Hey, welcome everybody to today's show. I'm very excited to have Dr. Abby Ballard of Ballard Family Chiropractic in Effington, Illinois with me today. Dr. Ballard's expertise and specialty is in maternal and pediatric chiropractic. She is an expert in optimizing health and function from preconception, through pregnancy, through birth, and postpartum for both the mother and child. Uh, she's also going to be one of the speakers at the Autism One Conference in May 2018. So we're very excited to have her expertise on board today. Abby, welcome to the show. Hi, John. Mike, thanks for having me. You're welcome. And for those listening on the podcast, I just want to let you know we are video recording this. So my YouTube channel will also have uh, the video if you're interested in actually watching and seeing Dr. Abby's pretty face. That's at youtube.com slash Accelerate Cairo, or you can just search John Bartimus on YouTube and my channel will come up. So Abby, why, for the listeners out there who may not be familiar with chiropractic, why is chiropractic important for both maternal health and the newborn? You know, it's a, it's a big topic, but really it all comes down to optimizing function you know as a, as a functional medicine doctor and as a functional neurologist yourself mm -hmm. you know that there's a difference between living life and living life to its fullest potential so I see moms that come in or actually we'll take a step back girls that come in that are having difficulty getting pregnant and I know you see this in your functional medicine practice mm -hmm. what I would like to see is that we have women that are healthy enough to get pregnant and right. do it on their own, right? And then once we get past that point, I wanna see that they carry a healthy baby that grows and develops normally, and that they have a healthy labor and delivery that their body can control on its own. Because ultimately, if we can have a healthy mom that has a healthy pregnancy and delivers a healthy baby, you're gonna have a healthy a baby that grows into a healthy child and a healthy adult. You know, when you start to look at the health of the United States, I believe it was uh, my son and your, actually your children as well are part of the first generation with a life expectancy shorter than their parents. Right. So you have to ask the question, where did this process start to go wrong? And then what can we possibly do to start to see a reversal of this current trend? So I know just like you, my mission is to grow a healthier community one family at a time. And that starts with healthy moms having healthy pregnancies. Awesome. I love it. And, and, for the nerds out there, while you were speaking, I was I was thinking as you were saying, I want to take girls, allow them to have a a have fertility and a natural birth and a healthy child, and that child becomes, you know, a parent as well. I'll, what I'm thinking while you're walking through that is epigenetics, right? Oh, absolutely. I when I was in uh, undergrad, I did a study and they looked at epigenetic differences. Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here with the internet connection. Chronic diseases for our children. This is not genes. Genes don't change this fast. This is environmental changes. And so when we, the, in that paper, what they looked at were health differences in identical twins. And what they saw was when you had a child that, whose gene structure should be the same as his twins, when you change their environment, you saw differences in health outcomes. So if they have a diet that's crappy and they eat a lot of fast food and they don't exercise, their health outcomes are going to be worse than their twin who maybe does eat well and does exercise. So even with the exact same genetic makeup, you can change whether or not those genes are turned on or off, that gene right. expression. That's epigenetics. Right. So, so what you're saying is you want to optimize the epigenetics or the genetic expression of these moms and children so that... Basically, evolutionary success is improved generation to generation. Absolutely, because one of the things I think we don't think about, but, you know, I, I had all little boys. Um, you have some little girls. And when <laughs> your wife, Kate, was growing these babies, those baby girls were born with eggs. You know, so okay. you can affect not just your child's generation, but the health of your grandchildren by, mm -hmm. by changing your diet and cleaning up your diet and uh, supporting normal healthy function of the cells and by, by recognizing that if there's something going on in your body not, if there's a process that's going wrong you got there it was something that developed over time so it stands to reason that if we find the the thing that started to go wrong 
and support it, we can start to see a reversal of that trend. Absolutely. And so I think the, the astute listener is, is, is agreeing with everything we're saying, but they're probably saying, so where does chiropractic fit? Isn't that just backs and necks? <laughs> Absolutely. And I, we hear a lot of that backs and neck stuff, but I really think that that's a very narrow view of what chiropractic is. Mm -hmm. You know, chiropractic, do we focus on, do some doctors focus on spinal care and pain relief? Absolutely. But that's not what the philosophy of chiropractic was really about. We are meant as chiropractors to help remove interference to the expression of something called innate intelligence. So innate intelligence really says that the body has the ability to heal. Mm -hmm. And the, the, if we can just help to remove kind of those epigenetic factors, right? If we can help you to clean up your diet, give you the supplements that you, your body might need to get itself back on track, then that's true healing. And that's the, the heart of chiropractic. From a chiropractic, more um, structural spinal per perspective, when you have a mom that comes into your office, in obstetrics, they often talk about the three Ps. We have power, passenger and passage, right? So from a, a labor and delivery standpoint, power just means that the body and the brain are well connected and you're getting good communication. We know that the nerves around the sacral plexus are going to affect the uterus. We know that we need the ovaries and uterus to be on track, producing the right hormones, releasing the right hormones at the right time, communicating with the brain so that the other glands can be functioning and assisting in that process. So we need to make sure that that power, that connection between body and brain is at 100% if you're going to push a baby out of your body. Correct. The other so, thing, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. So, so I love it. So just to take the power and the connection from body and brain and make it more scientific or mainstream, that would be saying optimizing endocrine function and the negative feedback loops like the, the, the brain ovarian axis, basically. Yes, absolutely. And I, that's one of the things that I work with and I know that you work with when we have fertility cases. So I just want a brief tangent here. Yeah. I want you guys to think about birth control. Not a, So many women don't even think about it as being a medication. Right. It's beyond a medication. This is hormone replacement therapy. Right. And we're putting girls on it as young as 13, 14 because of irregular cycles. They should be irregular, guys. This is how your body learns to control, or rather your brain learns to control your body through that feedback loop, that HPA or HPO axis. Mm -hmm. So we're putting girls on hormone replacement therapy, and then we're leaving them on it until we decide we want to have children, which might be in their 20s or might be in their 30s. And then we take them off those hormones, and then we're like, I can't believe you can't regulate your hormone systems. <laughs> but your body has to go back through that loop. If I put you on a blood sugar medication and you didn't really have sorry a little bit of technical difficulties again with the internet connection communication between the body and the brain to help those feedback loops work and work well each time that happens that connection is going to get stronger uh, unless of course we're really nutrient deficient or we've exhausted a gland but that's a kind of another story so with chiropractic when we're working on glandular systems or to support glandular systems we're working to support something called the autonomic nervous system or automatic. That's blood vessel gland organ control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned earlier that people typically think of us for neck pain, low back pain, but those sensory nerves don't account for a huge portion of our nerves. We have the autonomic nerves and we have motor nerves as well. So when I'm worried about a pregnant mom, I'm just not worried about, Hey, how's your pelvis doing? How's your hip pain? How's, right. how's your neck pain? I'm also worried about those autonomic nerves. How's your glandular function? Are we still producing enough progesterone? Are we gonna be able to make that um, relax in later on in your pregnancy so that your pelvis can really spread? So all of those things are a consideration um, of keeping that brain and body well connected to optimize hormone production. Uh, and then also to make sure that whenever your body goes, hey, listen, now really is go time. I'm getting the right hormones that you could go, okay, now we're gonna start coordinating the other types of nerves to get these contractions going, to spread the hips and push baby down and then out of your body. Awesome, so that's, that was the power P. Mm -hmm. And then P number two? Uh, passage and then passenger, and they kind of go hand in hand. So yeah. when you think about the support structure for a baby, you have the woman's pelvis, mm -hmm. and then you also have round ligaments on each side, and then something called the uterosacral ligament. 
So that runs from the sacrum, which the sacrum is triangle shaped bone mm -hmm. uh, at the base of the spine. So if you guys have ever seen a woman with low back dimples or a man with low back dimples, that's where the sacrum meets the two pelvic bones, the iliac crest. So that bone there, that triangle shaped bone, that sacrum has a ligament that runs directly towards and attaches to the uterus and it acts as a major support structure for that uterus. So if that pelvis is rotated or that sacrum is rotated, it will put unequal pull, uh, unequal support for the uterus. Mm -hmm. And I'll see women come in and they'll complain that a round ligament is sore on one side or another, uh, especially with transitioning from like sitting to standing or that kind of thing. They'll get sharp stabby pains uh, kind of at the front, kind of by their groin. Mm -hmm. And usually I see that imbalance in their pelvis. And the problem is you're going to put, I kind of think of it like this. Think of your uterus like a bedroom, <laughs> bedroom, bedroom for baby. And it's, 300 square foot bedroom. Yeah. If we were to go, okay, we're having another kid. We got to make some space here. We're going to move your bedroom into the attic. The attic is still 300 square foot, but there's less space to put things because of the eaves. Does that yeah. make sense? Square yeah. footage is the same. Same thing will happen in a woman's pelvis. When things really get twisted and torqued, then that's what we'll see is that effectively it narrows the space for the baby. It's still there. Space is still there. Your uterus didn't really get smaller. It's just torqued a little bit. Just laid out poorly. Exactly. And yeah. so we'll see that, you know, the ligaments will start to carry weight unevenly. The uterosacral ligament uh, will get extra tension on it from being malpositioned. And then that effectively leaves less room for baby. And when a baby has less room, they can't get into that optimal position for labor and delivery, which is the left occiput anterior. So it means lined up on mom's side, back of their head is towards the front. Uh, so... That's the position we want them to be on, it be in. But if we take the uterus and then we effectively twist it or narrow the space, that means less room for baby to maneuver into that ideal position. And, and so that, then we end up with more babies that are failing to descend, uh, so mom doesn't dilate in the face as easily, uh, or we end up with babies that are sunny side up or breech or that sort of thing. Okay, so so tying this together, a a a breech birth and all that comes with it could have possibly been prevented if mom's pelvis had been optimally aligned by seeing a chiropractor through pregnancy. Yes, there's a specific uh, chiropractic techniques. Webster in specific is the one that we use to help to optimize the position of the pelvis. Now that's not to say that if your chiropractor is not trained in Webster that they're unable to do these things, mm -hmm. but Webster is a technique specifically to balance the structure of the, of the pelvis for a pregnant mom. We also work in Webster to balance the tone of the round ligaments, the ones that support the baby in the front. So you don't just uh, affect, you know, the sacrum, the stuff in the back and the spine, but you also work on the, the abdomen a little bit to allow the baby enough free. Gotcha. Thank you. That is awesome. And uh, we're having a little bit of internet in and outage here. So Dr. Abby froze on us for a second, but while we're waiting for her to come back, um, a question I have for you, Abby, because I believe you can still hear me, is um, you there? Yep, I am back now. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. So my question there is, if someone's breech and you're using a Webster technique, um, or, or the, the minute a mother is told by her OBGYN that she is breech, you know, is there a certain amount of lead time where a Webster technique, there's not enough time for the Webster technique to work, or you need... Gotcha. X amount of time? I will tell you, um, if you are pregnant with twins, it typically takes about twice as long as, as a single baby. But the, the and, perfect window... And just is, so you know, people, um, Abby had twins, so she's... <laughs> yeah, I sure did. ...experienced in this stuff. Yes. Uh, I have a, a five-year-old, twin three-year-olds, and a one-year-old. But uh, the, um, the window, like the perfect little window is like 32 to 35 weeks because baby is uh, it's still small enough that they have plenty of space, but mom is far enough along too that the baby's less likely to move back breech. Um, the, I mean, I've had babies that were as old as 38 weeks that have gone into optimal positioning after, after an adjustment. So even when you're far along, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that baby can't, the can't turn. But what we need to make sure is that mom's pelvis is, is as open as it can be, and that uterus is as well balanced as it can be, and then we just let nature do its thing. Babies, unless there's a reason, they're meant to be head down. 
you know, that, that they know uh, and innately they will be head down um, unless there's some sort of other issue. Uh, and sometimes there are things that you can't help. Sometimes there is a short cord or, or something crazy that you don't expect. Mm-hmm. Um, but the vast majority of the time, if we can help mom's pelvis to be in the most ideal position, then baby can do their thing, get themselves right where they need to be. Excellent. So as we move forward to now baby passage and birth, um, segueing from the head down position, obviously if they're in optimal position, then the head is the first thing to come out. And so, you know, what can that lead to? (laughs) Oh gosh. You know, um, I will say C-sections are are a heck of a thing. I myself ended up with a C-section with, well, all of my, my pregnancies, but it was not for lack of trying, <laughs> but uh, with my with my first, I remember, and I would encourage you guys to do this. Go to YouTube and um, look at a couple C-section videos because we kind of fool ourselves into believing that C-sections are gentle in some way because yeah. natural birth is so hard on babies and hard on mom. You know, we, we kind of discount the the physiological effects of labor and delivery, like the benefits of it. Um, but when we're talking about a C-section delivery, I really think there is, there's a time and a place, but we are, we're playing kind of fast and loose with, with necessary and emergency, these, these terms as it comes to C-sections. Cause I think our, our C-section rate currently is around 30% if I, if I remember right. Yeah. It's basically, I, it's basically one in three. Yeah. That's what I thought. And uh, we're not, VBACs are, are safe. There's plenty of research out there and now they're kind of changing their, their tone to say that. Um, even after, even after two C-sections, you should be allowed to attempt a VBAC. So, you know, do some Googling if, (laughs) if your doctor says that you don't have the option, but there is definitely some sequela of events that can happen after a C-section delivery. So it's not just, oh, baby's here and they're perfect and they're safe and that's all that matters. I think that a number of women are, are going into labor and delivery without all of the facts, without all of the information. And there's a study, I'm going to find it real fast, just to kind of tie this thing together, because we know that neurodevelopmental disorders are on a really steep incline in the United States. I think the most recent statistic was one in 32 children now have autism, an autism diagnosis. That, like I say, that's way, that's way beyond genetic changes. Yeah. And so we have to start going, what are these other factors that are contributing to the development of autism in our children? And so there was this really interesting paper that was... Uh, published in 2016. I'll show it to you. I don't know, I don't know if you have this one, John. You see that? Increased yeah. risk of autism development. Yeah, I have that one. Okay, so John might be able to, um, to bring that up into a screen share for us. But this paper is especially interesting because they looked at what were the risks for children Okay, one second, Abby, you, you've broken up. So while Abby's coming back to us, this study was in the uh, American Society for Neurochemistry, the July-August 2016 version, and Abby's back. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I would set up my wireless hotspot, but I think it would take more time than we've got. Um, right. So I see a number, and when I say a number, I mean the vast majority of the moms that come into my office that are nearing the end of their pregnancy, they talk about their induction date. I don't know why they have it, (laughs) to be honest. These are moms who are not at risk, that aren't showing signs of of preeclampsia, whose babies are healthy, fluid levels are normal, but they're talking to me about being induced. Not showing signs and symptoms that they're going to be delivering a baby soon and they're still okay i'm so sorry that's all right um so so you you were at the point of um you were speaking about mothers with induction dates and they're they're showing no signs of needing induction. It's more like an elective induction or this concept of choosing your birth date. And it goes back to our society and and not seeing C-sections as a major surgery, not seeing birth control pills as hormone replacement. It's just like, Oh yeah, it's a convenience thing. Here we go. So 
Do you want to yes. jump back off from that point? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's what I, that's what I see all the time is that this, this is just as an option, every option. There's, there's no, there's no real medical in the sea, but we just want you to know that you can choose this. And so the vast majority do, you know, if you were a mom and you were far along and you were uncomfortable, and especially if you have other little kids, you start to consider these things like I am so over being pregnant. Why not? They say that they can do it. Let's just get this ball. Let's, let's get this. Let's get the show on the road. Yeah. But I don't think anybody is truly the heart of informed consent is knowing that whatever choice you're making might have some consequences. So that's what this study said. They said labor and delivery drugs are associated with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, the Southwest autism research and resource center shows that labor induction that the labor induction drug pitocin is significantly associated with autism spectrum disorders they also observed a synergistic effect between administrations of labor and delivery drugs and experiencing a birth complication intervention begets intervention guys so if your body is not ready to do it and your cervix is high tight and close it's no surprise to me when you go in and they start thinking and think like that and so then you have a lot of pain from the Pitocin, and then you end up with a pain medication. And then you can't move into positions that help baby to drop down farther in the birth canal. So over time, baby is extra stress, and then we start to see fluctuations in heart rate and respiration, and then before we know it, we're in an emergency C-section. But they're not even going that far. They're not even looking at C-sections right now. What they're looking at is just, if you say, okay, I'm going to induce, and I'm going to go ahead and opt to get some Pitocin to move things along, you're putting your child at an increased risk of autism. How many of us would elect an induction? We go, yeah, okay, I think I want to do that. If our obstetrician sat down with us and said, you can go into labor on your own, and you have no extra risk there, or we can go ahead and induce you, and you do have this extra risk. What do you want to do? But we're not going through that step. At least in, in my community, we're not going through that, that step. And I had a, a lady um, honestly scold me. She told me that I shouldn't put out papers like this because you know her kids were induced and this things like this scare women. And I said, this should scare women. Yeah. I have had, and I'm not even kidding, in five years in a pediatric practice, I have had, I can count on my hands the number of women that have come to my office that had natural, spontaneous labor and deliveries that were drug-free. It's just not really done around my, in my community. So the more I can advocate for natural labor and delivery and then back it up with research and say, this is one of the reasons why, then the, the more I'm gonna have an effect to actually change the trend that we're seeing in my community. Yeah, and, and I just wanna underscore that, you know, Dr. Abby didn't write this paper. This isn't a blog. This is a scientific peer-reviewed research study. So if it scares you, then like she said, it should. And what, it, what should really scare you is not the study, but the fact that you're not receiving the informed consent that you should. Because Absolutely. again, if the doctor is just explaining to you nonchalantly, oh yeah, we'll just C-section, no big deal, then, then you, you hear the communication of, hey, it's no big deal, why not? Um, whereas mm -hmm. if they, like Abby said, if she, they sat down with you and said, here, this Evidence-based scientific peer-reviewed paper says if you get these labor and delivery drugs, you may, your child has an increased risk of autism. Now, all of a sudden, it's not a nonchalant conversation. It's a, hey, I don't think I want to do pump, this. Yeah. Pump your brakes, Doc. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, yeah. And, you know, you know, I was talking to you guys about, I have a theory for why, why that, that risk of autism is, is correlated with the labor and delivery drugs. And like I said, I really feel like intervention begets intervention. So um, when we get a, a baby that is, that is more stubborn because they're maybe not ready <laughs> to, to leave the womb, uh, there was a really interesting study in uh, obstetrics and gynecology from 2005 that I'll have Dr. John throw up in just a couple minutes where they looked at what it took. If, if we are going to intervene, intervene and we need to use vacuum or forceps, which I had a labor delivery nurse tell me once, if they're using forceps, it should be like, pick them up, blow the dust off. Like these are things that should not be used routinely. Uh, they're emergency or life-saving interventions. And so keeping that in mind, what they thought was, well, we could be an obstetrician to pull with a certain amount of force. 
So if we are in an emergency situation and that doctor has to assist with the vacuum or forceps, they wanted to know, can we tell them this amount of force is okay and safe for a baby's head and neck, this amount of force is not. And what they found was that they could train doctors to pull at a certain amount of force in the short term by doing it over and over and over and over. But they lost that ability in the long term. So let me ask you, if you can only repeat it in the short term, but these are supposed to be interventions that are rarely used, how much force is that doctor pulling on your baby with? Right. And, and you know, hate to segue for you, um, but then <laughs> I, I guess I dare do this and you can brush it off if you want, but we were discussing off air the studies of, of uh, Atlanta occipital misalignment and SIDS. Yes. And so, so, you know, too much force could cause the Atlanta occipital misalignment, which is basically the skull on the first bone of the neck misalignment. Mm -hmm. And studies for years have been associating that with SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. And so yeah. sudden infant death syndrome is looked at as an idiopathic deal or something that doesn't, there's no known cause, but could it be the force okay. from forceps from the delivery? Yeah, uh, there was a, a study in the American Journal of, this, of the Disabled Child that looked at Atlanta occipital um, instability, and that was published in 79. Uh, and what they did, they looked at 17 infant cadavers, 11 of which were SIDS cases, six were non-SIDS cases, so accidental death. Um, 10 of the 17 cases had that instability of the atlas, which caused the atlas to move too, too far into the, the space of the brainstem, or I'm sorry, the, the foramen magnum, which is right near the, the brainstem. Of those 10 cases that demonstrated that uh, instability, all 10 were SIDS cases. Um, so wow. like I say, that's not, that's not new. It's not new research. That was in 79. Um, but there's a number, there's a number of studies out there. And like I say, it's, it's a bit, it's a big deal. And I, I always tell people, um, you know, before you start doing the thing, like I'm a big fan of some stomach, stomach sleeping for babies. I think from a neurodevelopmental perspective, it's better for the child than back sleeping, mm -hmm. but I want to check that baby before you start to stress their head with the rotation. All that rotation comes from occiput C1 and C2. So those first few bones in the neck and the occiput. So if, especially if that's been stressed, extra stress by a hard labor and delivery and maybe vacuum or forceps, I want to put my hands on that baby and check things out before we put them in those, um, those stressful positions and further stress an area that might not be stable. And that, folks out there, is the answer as to why you should have your newborn checked as soon as possible after birth. Yep. I got to study. Yeah. <laughs> I got to study but, about it. For real, we want to look at, is there any Atlanta occipital misalignment or any misalignment of the bones of the upper neck that could be affecting cord and, and bottom of the brainstem and those nerves that innervate the breathing centers and the heart rate and, and the autonomic centers of the body. So getting that baby checked, that newborn checked as soon as possible after birth allows you to find it as early as possible, clear it up, and not allow it to develop into something, uh, something negative or, or an event that we would never forget and we don't want to ever experience. Yeah, and actually there's a quote from daughter that she said, um, frequently the trauma to the, to the upper cervical spine remains subclinical with symptoms arising at a later time. These symptoms include but are not limited to irritability, colic, failure to thrive syndromes, and those syndromes associated with lowered immune responses. So it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that they're saying it might not show up immediately, mm -hmm. but if your baby has these challenges, get into the chiropractor, you know, have this checked out. Um, one thing I want to mention to you guys before I, before I move on to this study is there was a, a study and I'll just show it briefly. I don't even know if you can see it here. It's obstetrical forces training using visual feedback, etc. This is the study I was talking about where they were trying to train obstetricians. I just want you to know that at rest, a baby has about three and a half pounds of pressure on it. During contraction, that boosts to 12 pounds. Uh, when mom is pushing, up to 27 pounds of force on the baby from the, the contractions of mom. When, when a doctor assists with vacuum or forceps, 
they should be using that assistance only during a push phase. So mom's pushing and baby has about 27 pounds of force on them. They said on average, a doctor's assisting with 25 pounds of pull. So I want you to think about that. That's 52 pounds of combined pressure and pull on a baby, on the head and the neck. If I walked over to your newborn in their pumpkin seat and I picked them up by their head and just held them with the weight of the car seat, you would come unglued. But we accept this. We accept this because we know that it's to save the life of a child or wow. presumably to save the life of a child. But this study, what they looked at, because I, you know, I talked to you a minute ago about if we can train them in the short term, but these are emergency procedures that should only happen every so often, we're not doing a good job of training them in the long term. Right. So on average, we're pulling at 25 pounds of pressure. But the max force for women is 45 pounds standing, 63 pounds when they're sitting. Men can get up to 85 pounds of pull when they're using vacuum and forceps. Like that's, I think, wow, what it, so is it internal decapitations at 120? Wow, right? so, so, a, so a, female, a female doctor assisting can pull up to 63 pounds, and if your assisting doctor is male, it could be 83 pounds. That's what you uh, six, six, 61 for women and then 85 Sorry. for men. But okay. yeah, like so, that's incredible forces, especially if you couple that with the push from mom at 27 pounds. Yeah. Uh, baby. Yeah. It, so, Go ahead. Um, so, so that's, that's, you broke up there at the end, so I didn't hear the last thing you said, but the, the next segue from there would be, okay, that's obvious. If I had a birth and my baby had forceps or vacuum extraction, I absolutely have to get them to Dr. Abby or, or, you know, the chiropractor in my area to be assessed. But what if yes. I had, what if I was one of those people you can count on one hand that had a natural birth with no pull, with no vacuum or forceps or C-section, well, then this next study yes, says, yes. hey, you should still have your baby checked because... Yes, absolutely. This was from the journal, journal, <laughs> well, you know, the journal of the American Osteopathic Association in 2015, and they looked at the incidence of something called somatic dysfunction in healthy newborns. So somatic dysfunction in chiropractic, we call this a subluxation. It's that lack of proper motion um, in that upper cervical spine. So what they concluded was that somatic dysfunction of the cranial, cervical, and sacral regions was common in healthy newborns. In fact, they looked at 100 newborns and 99% of them had uh, some sort of uh, subluxation. They called it a... Uh, sphenobasilar synchondrosis strain pattern, but it's kind of fancy terminology. Just know that what this means is that their bones are not moving as well. This is important, guys, because I need you to understand that the brain has a job. And a lot of times we say that it's the, the job of the brain to control and coordinate the Hold on, Abby, you're breaking up, and this is very important, what you're telling them, so we'll wait for you to come back online here. While we're waiting for Abby, also in the conclusion, the study says total somatic dysfunction, so total number of misalignments, was related to length of labor. So, Computer. Okay, there we are. Okay, so here she is back. So st start that very important um, concept over again. Okay, so um, like I said, they, they had this big fancy terminology for it, but ultimately it means that that things are not moving as well as they should. But it, what's very important to know is when we talk about the brain, a lot of us will say that it's the job of the brain to control and coordinate all of their life processes. But I would challenge that just a little bit. And so with the, the PhD Bruce Lipton, when he said it's the job of the nervous system to perceive the environment. So we have to have something to respond to, right? And that input, when we talk about that input, it comes from proprioceptors, uh, and that's Dr. John can talk all about all that, all, all that someday. But just know that we need to deliver information from the body to the brain. And 60% of that communication is gonna come from the spine of that about 33% from the upper cervical. Yeah. So this is the area we can get. And then 99 the time, there's some disruption in that motion. That means we're gonna get crappier communication to the brain. What happens when we eat a crappy diet? We put crap in, we get crappy out. Mm -hmm. So we're to see this in our kids, but they don't go, hey, mom, I've got crappy messages here. I'm getting some, 
So just some, I don't have, I have bad motions, it's dyskinesia, and I'm getting bad messages, disaffrontation. They don't, they don't say that. Instead, they end up colicky. They just don't feel good. They seem uncomfortable. They're arching a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, these are the things that I hear from my, my moms, but it all goes back to the body and the brain are not communicating well. Well, so we can't control them. Well, now our baby is spitting up too much. They're not happy. Their belly hurts. They're grumpy. They're constipated. All of these are a sequela of events, and it really it all comes down to the fact that the body is not being controlled as well as it should by the brain. And it can start for 99% of babies. It starts during the birth process, even when that birth process is typical, normal, and fairly uneventful. Yeah, so that's very powerful, very powerful. And I hope everyone out there is, is getting the magnitude of that because a, a, your dream birth may still, unless your baby's that 1%, your dream birth still results in that baby needing to be assessed. And if there's something there, needing to have that corrected by the chiropractor so that what mm-hmm. we started out the show talking about today, they are living and functioning optimally their genes are being expressed optimally and they're, they're, they're developing the immune system and the nervous system and the organ function that will not only lead to healthy baby today, but lead to healthy adolescent, healthy adult, healthy fertility, healthy next generation. Yes. And I want to add just one other thing. Uh, I know we're, we're getting a little long on time. Um, you know, John mentioned that I get to be a speaker at, at autism one, which I'm, I'm very, I'm very excited about. And I, one of the trends that I see, one of the, the hot button topics now is, is leaky gut, leaky gut. And I see a lot of parents uh, with children that are on the spectrum or that have behavioral problems and they are, they're modifying diet, they're supplementing, they're doing the right things. But I feel like we're missing a key piece of the puzzle, which is chiropractic care. And I say that because we know now that we had some sensations at birth that's keeping him from expressing their, their full potential upper cervical spine, I want you to know that it has an effect on something called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve has a very um, calming effect on the nervous system and on neurology. And there was a really great paper um, called The Vagal Innervation of the Gut and uh, Immune Homeostasis. So when Dr. John's talking here about optimizing function, this paper was, is incredible. Uh, what they, they came to conclude here was that the vagus nerve and the way that it comes down and then innervates the gut, uh, by stimulating the vagus nerve, we potently reduce intestinal inflammation, restoring intestinal homeostasis. So I want you to think about that. If, if our gut is breaking into some function and for neurotransmitter production, and we have a disruption in communication that affects the vagus nerve and keeps it from doing its, uh, its best job, then we're gonna have more issues with immune system function and neurotransmitter production. So if we have issues with immune function, GI function and neurotransmitter production, those are all things that lead to symptoms in autism. And I think that's where Dr. Abby was going. So if you're back, you can pick that up, Abby. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry I dropped out there, but you're absolutely right. We are, we're treating chiropractic for these kids as an adjunct therapy. We're doing PT, we're doing OT, we're doing supplements, and we'll go to the chiropractor on occasion. But if we, with the adjustment, by, by working and stimulating that vagus nerve, can have a potent effect on, on the, the GI system, then we can start to change the inflammation levels in that individual, calm the nervous system, balance function for them. And to me, that doesn't seem like an adjunct therapy. This seems like it has the opportunity to dramatically change the lives for these, for these children. So that's, you know, part of my motivation today is because we we're now seeing more chronically ill children. So I'm looking at this from, from, uh, you know, a parent's perspective, from a parent's perspective. My children don't have autism, but I can tell you that the autistic children that I see in my practice have this in common. And I want you guys to think about this your child might not be on the spectrum, but they may still be having some of these same challenges. So it just was a really, a really great study. And I want you to know that chiropractic has so much more potential Absolutely. for health and healing 
then then we're giving it credence for. And and when we when we minimize it to neck pain and low back pain, you're really missing the magic that's in chiropractic. The job of chiropractic is, is to reconnect, restore, to balance, to harmonize the system. And yes, sometimes support. You know, sometimes absolutely we need to step in with uh, appropriate supplementation to help you get back on track. But it's always with that goal of restoring and repairing and getting your body to the point that it can restore and repair itself. And so if I am gonna live out my mission of growing a healthier community one family at a time, it's an obvious step to start from birth or in some cases preconception to grow healthy babies, have intervention-free labors and deliveries, and then check those babies to make sure from day one, they're growing up without interference and with a nervous system that can properly regulate the inflammation, <laughs> its guts, that eats, sleeps, and poops, and is happy. Absolutely. And there's, there's, there's so much more we could get into. And so we might have to have you on a second time, Abby, to talk about C-sections and the lack of the uh, bacterial exposure from the vaginal canal for the baby and how that impacts probiotics and immune development and all of those things. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. today we don't have the time for that. So I want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise. This was an amazing show, and I think it's going to do, go a long way in educating not only the people in your community, but in my community. And because of the digital world we live in, anyone can have access to it if they can find it. So thank you for that. Um, how can the listeners and viewers get a hold of you, um, get more of your content, reach out to you, connect with you, come in and be patients? Sure. Uh, as, as John said, I practice in central Illinois, a town called Effingham. So if you are local, um, for which for us in rural Illinois is like, if you live in about a half an hour, 45 minutes away, I'm local to you. Um, but you can visit us online. Uh, we have our website, BallardFamilyChiro.com. You can hop on there to uh, sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to the office, hear about upcoming events, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have our testimonials uh, available to view there. Um, you can find us on Facebook, uh, and I will be doing a Facebook live video uh, starting after the first of the year every Tuesday night at 8. I'm going to jump on Facebook, and the topic will change weekly. Sometimes it'll be informational. Sometimes it'll be a question and answer. Uh, my, my talks in January are going to be in January are gonna be about the perfect storm. So those neurodevelopmental disorders and, and tied in with chiropractic, of course. Um, and then again, if you are local, you can, uh, you can always call us or text us at 217-347-5010. Awesome, and Abby, on Facebook, is that a practice page? What's, what's the name of the page that they can find your live events? Oh, yes. Um, I'm, it's facebook.com slash Ballard Family Cairo. Uh, I don't know if you can see my shirt. Ballard Family Chiropractic, but the, the you internet, can find us there. The internet's not allowing, oh, there it is. It, it flashed on quick, but it's, it's B as in boy, A-L-L-A-R-D, Family Cairo, C-H-I-R-O. So please check her out on Facebook and uh, get on those weekly live Facebook live events to, to soak in more of the massive amount of information she has for you uh, that can help you optimize your conception, your pregnancy, your birth, and your postpartum care, as well as the growth of your little ones. So Abby, thank you so much for uh, the knowledge bombs, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Have a great day. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. And again, to the listeners, if you're on the podcast and you want to view this episode and actually see the research papers we discussed, um, you can check us out on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash accelerate, like accelerate in a car, go faster, accelerate Cairo, or just search John Bartimus in YouTube and my channel will come up. We'll be talking to you again soon. The next installment of the expert series will be coming up with Dr. Ryan Cedarmark, who is a chiropractor, nurse practitioner, functional neurologist. We're excited to have him on. Have a great day.